Uh, my name is Tiffany Gray. Um, I'm a recent uh, doctoral graduate in public health. Um, so I'm a public health researcher and professional, um, fairly new to blockchain and, and healthcare. And I'm really interested in the intersection of utilizing blockchain um, to address public health problems and approaches in population health. And I'm also interested in the ethical and regulatory considerations and implications. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and get started. If we can start with some introductions, um, each introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about how you came to blockchain and healthcare. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm the professor. I don't know if there are other professors, but it's an exchange, and I might break out into a Socratic method at any moment, so I hope you are paying attention. My name is Tanya Evans. I'm a tenured professor of law at the University of New Hampshire School of Law, uh, formerly known as Franklin Pierce Law Center, where we focus on intellectual property and uh, technology. And in fact, in the fall, I will, in addition to my teaching obligations, where I teach and write and speak about primarily copyright and new technologies, and I've, I've taken a deep dive because of the rabbit hole that is uh, blockchain and crypto uh, on distributed ledger technologies as well. Um, and in the fall, I will be the chair of the Intellectual Property and Technology Online Programming, where we're focused not only on the JD side, but sometimes people don't have three years to uh, kick around uh, these legal principles, but want access to the information that makes the legal education so valuable. So I'll be uh, doing that as well. I uh, grew up in Philadelphia. I am a tennis player, and so I took a very non-traditional uh, path. In fact, I must love you because the French Open is on, if you all don't know. Uh, but I uh, was awarded a four-year tennis scholarship at Northwestern University, graduated uh, with honors, and then played professionally for four years before attending law school. Uh, I clerked in the Third Circuit, worked at two um, international firms. My mother is also a patent attorney, so I joined her in practice uh, before going out on my own and then finding my way to academia. Uh, I within the last year really did take a deep dive. I, I find the technology fascinating. I was originally drawn to understand about cryptocurrencies and uh, then started looking more broadly about the legal implications of blockchain technology, which is what we're going to talk about uh, uh, specifically in the healthcare industry. And I look forward to talking more about that with you uh, in moments. My name is Jim Kelly. I have spent my entire career in healthcare revenue cycle. I've seen it from the angles of internal audit, revenue cycle, process improvement. Uh, I was also involved with over four dozen uh, mergers and acquisitions of physician practices and hospitals. And then uh, most recently, uh, director of patient accounting at a local children's Children's Healthcare of Atlanta here in, uh, in Atlanta and uh, the responsibility for AR and uh, claims processing and payment processing. And so I would uh, be yelling at my rooftop of my car driving home every night uh, complaining about all the challenges and shortcomings that our industry faces. And I decided to convert those complaints to considerations for innovation. Uh, after I had a couple beers one St. Patrick's Day with one of my MBA classmates as he wanted to learn more about the challenges in healthcare and he inadvertently started, started to explain me some of the fundamental elements of what is blockchain, and that's really what opened my eyes to it. I had just sort of dismissed Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency up until that point, but then when I started learning about the way that he outlined it for me in terms of the fundamental elements, it was a pretty important thing for me to start uh, considering those complaints as ways that we could use those as use cases, perhaps, in terms of why we need to do things differently in healthcare. And so when I'd go to a conference like this, I'd go back home or go back to work, and I'd talk to people, and I'd realize I'm the only one in the co-working space or co-work, you know, or my colleagues that actually even have heard about blockchain. So most of the audience in healthcare that I've been a part of don't talk about this. So uh, I took it upon myself in my free time to try to learn what was going on in the space and I narrowed down the list of resources that I found helpful in my, uh, my learning and uh, over the last almost three years, I've compiled that into a list. It's an online resource now that I try to refer people to, which is GameChanger.com, and that's why that name is listed there. But it's just my, uh, uh, my attempt to try to bring more people to the conversation, because a handful of people working on this technology are not going to bring it to life to solve these pr problems that I've been plagued by for so many years. We have to get as many people into the conversation and up to speed on what it really means to be blockchain, so we can have a thoughtful dialogue. My name is Katherine Krauss. I'm the uh, founder of EMR Forensics Expert, LLC. 
and that was quite by accident. It wasn't uh, a designed career choice. I, I began my career, in, like Jim, I've been in healthcare my entire career, and um, so the last hundred years or so, I've been accumulating a little bit of information. <laughs> um, so I started as a registered nurse. Uh, my specialty was in the OR. I was certified there. I have worked in many different other venues in, in nursing as well. Then I was a single mom of two boys at the beginning of home computing and the internet. And once they kept crashing the computer, I decided I was going to get better than them. So I became a Microsoft certified systems engineer. <laughs> They're still better than I am, but they don't understand the MCSE OSI stack, so I've got one above them. Um, then uh, I thought I'd leave healthcare, but of course EMRs were becoming a big thing. And so um, I jumped back into healthcare um, right from the analytical point of view and building the, um, the EMRs, the integration, managing databases, and those kinds of things. And um, finally ended up as a CIO in a couple of academic centers in New York City. So uh, understanding the complexity of healthcare where you've got a thousand application and the entire OSI stack. Ransomware became a big deal. I was at Kings County in central Brooklyn and the intrusion risk was high. And so every day I'd come home very frustrated because I knew this was a gold mine for somebody that could get New York City Health and Hospitals held ransom. It was millions of dollars of uh, Bitcoin that we would need to release the, the hostage. Um, so I came home one day and I said to my son, um, this in infrastructure that we have in healthcare technology is unsustainable. It's cost prohibitive, the architecture is very old, it's very lucrative for nefarious characters. I said to him, what we need is to have our, you know, our EMR on our smartphone and we need to have APIs to our radiology results, our lab results, and it needs to be built on the blockchain, and we need to control our own medical records. He went online and three hours later came out with a patientory white paper, and I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> so I'm um, excited to be here. Um, I hope you get some value out of our panel. Thank you for coming. Who was not there in the morning for the keynote speech? So you know my background, right? So just in short, Klinisha, I'm, I'm I'm the kind of cross-functional guy. What motivates me is to understand the cross-section, to try to figure out uh, from a clinician to technologies to the business of technology, the science, <coughs> the operation, the marketing, the go-to-market sales, and ecosystem. Each one of these areas fascinates me, right? And I'm, I'm using this lens uh, for every kind of project that I'm, I'm involved with. And the other aspect uh, that, that drives me is uh, to try to figure out how one can take discovery in the basic science and compress the cycle time and economics of bringing that discovery to real world that it will produce real value. All the rest we can just continue this conversation. Thank you. So building upon that, what I'd like to start with is to ask you all, um, what are some of the uh, current regulations that are currently existing that may make it difficult for adoption of, of blockchain in healthcare? If you can all speak a little bit about that. Um, it, it's interesting to, it's, I'm going to go because evidently I'm in this poll position. Um, <laughs> but I would think about some of the issues that I'm talking about. Uh, after or after you get a firm grounding in some of the other uh, regulatory issues uh, that are part of this legal framework. I should also mention that in addition to my mother being a patent attorney, my father is a doctor. He's the first uh, black president of the Maine Medical Association and he is a delegate to the AMA. And he was talking quite a bit about the AMA incubator working in this space and that interested me greatly, particularly as I started to prepare for this area for my remarks today. But I'm focusing more broadly on intellectual property issues because when we think of uh, regulatory frameworks or more broadly legal frameworks, oftentimes when you are fully immersed in a discipline, you miss some of the other things that are uh, interrelated and in fact essential in most aspects, but give, you know, sometimes we give them short shrift. And when I say intellectual property, I'm talking about uh, patent, copyright, 
trademark as well and trade secret and both how they're tradition all of them are traditionally viewed and how we view them in light of open source software uh, proprietary software the bridge between the two and how uh, blockchain companies particularly in healthcare will leverage that because traditionally Obviously, patents are a critical component in many different areas. But what happens to patent rights, which is tr basically the right to exclude, exclude others from using, making, uh, or selling whatever the claimed invention is? And, and with that exclusivity uh, comes the value. Uh, what happens in an open source environment, both on the patent and the copyright side, where uh, the quid pro quo of utilizing open source software, or what I will now say is OSS, or I'm going to even start to bore myself, uh, when you're dealing with OSS, but also proprietary software, what happens to your ability to enforce patent protection? And also, I was thinking quite a bit about what the role of traditional intellectual property protections are, where uh, when we think about them generally, the exclusive rights are given in exchange for this uh, economic incentive. The idea is if um, exclusive rights are given for a certain period of time, in the case of patents, we're talking about 20 years. Uh, in the case of copyright, for example, it's life of the author of some creativity plus 70 years after death. Both of those uh, monopolies or IP regimes uh, apply to software. And so as we talk about the development of software, we'd be remiss without understanding the role that it plays. Uh, I argue that in this space, however, innovation is happening uh, outside of those traditional structures and necessarily so as the interoperability becomes critical, the ability uh, as we talk about moving across chains, having certain nodes, maybe uh, certain uh, healthcare providers, uh, patients and other patient adjacent uh, companies have control of certain information that may be off-chain, but there has to be some commonality in the way that information is exchanged, accessed, uh, and so forth. And so blockchain technology, distributed ledger technology, presents interesting questions about the role. That doesn't mean that there is no role to be had, and I'll talk about that as, as we continue the conversation, but uh, an, an integral part of understanding the overall regulatory landscape in healthcare is understanding the intellectual uh, property issue. Issues. Uh, I have some st statistics to share in a bit about patent uh, applications and the exponential growth of those. Uh, I sense that as we go forward, there will be some invalidation uh, issues that come up as well. And so that presents interesting questions as you manage an IP portfolio. So having lived in healthcare my entire career, I will say something that's probably pretty obvious. Healthcare is ripe for innovation, but there's a lot of challenges in the way, right? Uh, I think it's uh, understood that it's uh, got the, the industry of healthcare has more stakeholders than any other industry. I think that may be a fair statement. And then uh, it's also probably the slowest to innovate, perhaps because of all the regulation. And if you mention the words or the phrases, the Joint Commission, HIPAA, MTALA, you immediately get anyone who works in healthcare's attention. <laughs> they're going to stop what they're doing right there and then pay attention to what they're doing because of those ramifications that come along with those. Uh, when it comes to regulation, um, I would say. It's probably two lenses to look at it. It's probably either the transactional regulation or the oversight regulation. That's if I had to boil it down to two. Transactional would be the claim forms that we're in healthcare expected to submit all of our claim data to the payer in order to make sure that it is easy for the payer to translate and adjudicate. So you have the electronic formats, you have the paper formats. You could argue that those are regulations because everyone is expected to abide by those. But then you also have some examples of the oversight committees. The Joint Commission, like I mentioned, is going to come into a Joint Commission certified facility and make sure that certain things are being done in certain ways. So I think there's, uh, when you look at regulation in healthcare, you have to look at that and probably thinking, well, how does blockchain fit into all this? Well, I think for blockchain, there are fundamental elements of blockchain that I think make a lot of sense for consideration to help us with some of these fundamental problems of doing business with one another. And I think the challenge will be how can we create a blockchain use case and then test it while keeping in line with the guardrails that everyone in healthcare is 
expected to abide by while also allowing to have some sort of innovation that makes life better. I think that's really a challenge that we have to look at. And so I feel like the more people we get to the conversation, the more perspectives we have and the more trials and tribulations the blockchain can go through. But we have to address the fact that there are regulations that people are expecting HIPAA. They may not really understand what all HIPAA represents, but they say, oh, I can't have my information out there. I need to protect that. And so I think we have a lot of um, general understandings in healthcare space. They vary at times, right, who the audience is, but I think there's a, a, a pretty high bar that is expected to be abided by for anyone playing in a healthcare space. So I think in uh, those of us that have worked in healthcare a long time, we do understand that the regulatory change is slothful at best. I mean, sloths move probably faster than uh, regulations in healthcare. And we keep adding layers and layers of this technology. And I think of some of the quality metrics and, you know, all those names of, you know, MTAL and Joy Commission that do make us all seizure the minute we hear them. Um, the thing is the penalties are severe and, and we do need to have oversight over health care because it is human lives that we're looking after. But we also need to take a step back and say which of these are really affecting patient outcomes and I think I would, I would guess that a lot of the regulatory compliance is simply to add revenue to the insurance companies. So you know you talk about the, the slow change um, when I was at Kings County, there were insurance companies that would not accept electronic submissions for some of the re uh, reimbursement. And I'm, we had to print out green bar paper. I mean, you can't even buy those printers anymore. So we're going out on eBay, eBay buying the, uh, the tractor feed so that we could print out these papers to get reimbursed. So we have to move faster. You know, the exponential change and the, and the rapid pace of change um, the exponential growth of data, we have to begin to be leaders in this industry instead of being so slow to change. Um, and then I think that many of these regulatory compliance things are just an exercise in gathering information, again, for the insurance companies to say, no, we're not going to pay you this money. Um, but it's not actionable information, and especially in the clinical realm. You know, if the information is actionable, then that's great. But if you're just gathering it to gather information, then it's just a bucket of data that really isn't um, going to improve revenue, patient outcomes, or patient safety. Thank you. Uh, so from regulatory standpoint, the question of what regulation may uh, pose barrier to adoption of technology, the number of areas that I'm looking at, uh, first of all, is a regula regulation around privacy, right? So HIPAA mm -hmm. is the obvious one. But uh, the beauty that I see in blockchain is the notion of the disintermediation of the business model is to allow me and you and all of us to control who gets to see that. So mm -hmm. almost it makes HIPAA a non-issue because if mm -hmm. I'm the one, HIPAA can walk away. I'm controlling the shot. I'm, I'm calling the shots. But here comes G GDPR. So we're leaving the US and we go into the world, particularly to Europe, and GDPR comes with privacy issues well. Uh, Although blockchain uh, allows the user who, who has produced the data, I'm trying to be careful, we have a lawyer here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. You may continue. <laughs> whose data is about him, and I hopefully, hopefully we'll go into who owns the data, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, in any event, in GDPR, yeah, the, the blockchain allows me, if, I, if, I, if I'm in a Europe resident, right, I'm a citizen of Europe, right, to allow me to control that, but still there's a, a provision for all the, the commercial players, right, to say, well, that particular data has to physically reside within the geopolitical borders in Europe. I was hoping somebody will object what I said, <laughs> because I'm, I'm kind of a guy that I'm learning from objections to so bring them on so we can understand what the issues are. On really, on a very serious note, um, on one hand, and that's the kind of the conflict, the, the construction tension in blockchain, because my default assumption is every blockchain project is geopolitical border agnostic from the outreach to patients, outreach to, to mm -hmm. consumers, and the dissemination of data. However, GDPR comes and blocks are, or limits 
our capability to enjoy that. I'm involved in, in a project uh, that actually goes on a worldwide basis, and the, no, the value proposition is for all the consumers of data, the aggregates, right? Aggregators of data, be it pharma or be it retail. We talked about consumer; it's not just patient. Retail is also involved. In that. So the, the ability to provide worldwide base kind of data for their analysis is tremendous value in this. But so GDPR uh, is like limiting progress uh, in that regard, so we will have to deal with that. Right? Can I make one additional point? It's so critical what you just said because of this nature of this technology, both uh, blockchain specifically, but more broadly uh, distributed ledger technology as being agnostic or borderless, and yet it, it comes into tension and conflict yes, yeah. with the bordered and regionalized and nationalized laws that must be adhered to. So where's the give? And, and I liken it to in some, not in some sense, in many ways, like the development of the uh, the internet and the World Wide Web in the uh, early days, and so there's so many fantastic uh, standardization projects I'm, uh, involved in an ITU uh, distributed ledger and also um, digital asset group where. Uh, you know, from a multinational level, people have to work on these issues. We have to solve for this, otherwise it thwarts innovation in the ways that you said. Uh, so we have to be very mindful as this is moving at a meteoric pace, how to bring down the barriers to innovation, otherwise we're moving back, not forward. Yeah. The, the other barrier that I see in the regulatory space is the money part of mm -hmm. blockchain projects. So that more specifically relates to the Coinbase, and I tried to explain that at a high level, different blockchains, uh, mm -hmm. coin and coinless, whether you do ICO or not, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the moment I'm, I'm doing a blockchain project that has coins, right, now I'm immediately subject to regulation. Uh, that regulation is evolving, right? Uh, the regulators themselves around the world are struggling. They try to understand what in the world is going on and what does it mean to us. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you a real world story. So I organize, help organize uh, ICO Summit in Kazan. Not to be confused, confused with Kazakhstan. It's not <laughs> Kazakhstan, it's Kazan. It's in Tatarstan. It's like two hours east of, of Russia, like last month. And, and, and people came to, to us after the conference was over and say, hey, we represent investors from China. And I said, oh, that is very interesting. You should talk to us. Why well, should talk to you? Because those investors from China has a lot of money. Yeah, I, I hear you, but why should I still talk to you? And then they broke the news that China is about to come up. There's a notion, there's a rumor. China is, gonna, is about to, you know, uh, clamp down on, on, on ICOs and, and coins and tokens. That's the time to get in. So I told them, actually, you gave me the reason why not to talk to you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of issues here that relates to the fi financing of this project that also I think will uh, create a barrier for dissemination. So we have a few minutes left, but uh, so we, to help us wrap up, I would like to for you all to discuss. I said we just got started. What are some of the critical actions that need to happen um, in order within the next few months or the next year in order for uh, blockchain to uh, show significant movement from a regulatory perspective? So uh, some things to think about from the intellectual property side is one, uh, checking in with, uh, I know people don't like to hear this, but an intellectual property attorney, and not just any. Uh, I know in this space you understand that you can have a fantastic knee surgeon, but if you're going for a brain operation, that's not going to work so well. And so finding lawyers specifically uh, involved in intellectual property, but also who are technologists or have, are tech adjacent, but really appreciate that. There is an unbelievable uh, space for uh, lawyers who are also technologists to really move here. And so the first thing would be to uh, connect with an IP lawyer. If you are building or utilizing um, open so source software with the intention of also having some proprietary software as well, I'd look through and make sure that you have 
have standardized um, your licensing agreements that you understand how they work. Uh, some of the newer licenses also already incorporate, um, if you use this, you must keep it open or else. Uh, and also certain uh, retaliation clauses as well that to the extent one attempts to exercise their patent rights, that they would lose the right to use that software. So it's really under important to understand the bridge. I want to leave you with some patent statistics in particular to show the exponential growth in this space. Uh, Shepard Mullen, a law firm, looked uh, at January 2017 and did a search of patents and also published applications for the word blockchain in, in uh, January of 2017. There were 61 patents, 522 published uh, applications. And I checked this morning before uh, finalizing my remarks. Now there's a 70% increase just in a little over a year to 104 uh, filed patents and uh, 847 published published applications. It's a 62% growth in applications. And I could go on for smart contracts, for distributed ledger. And so people are moving in this space now that we've gotten past that, you know, blockchain 1.0. And people are building on top and finding novel ways to file patents. That's not to say they will not later be invalidated, because there's a lot of public information that may discredit or discount or invalidate uh, patent protection. But those are some of the things that, that we should be uh, thinking about in this space. As we look forward, I think we have to look both short term and long term. Uh, considering the vast majority of the healthcare market doesn't really know what blockchain is, I think it's going to be a huge challenge for anyone trying to create a lot of innovation. So I think when it comes down to boiling the ocean, as they say, uh, and going for the shoot the moon, whatever phrase you want to say, I don't think that really makes a lot of sense because someone's going to say, well, how are you going to get there? And I think uh, what I've taken away from the three or so years I've looked into this is that uh, if you can get the stakeholders to agree around a certain problem. And the stakeholders are adversaries in healthcare, whether we like it or not. We've got the payer and the provider, and they are on the opposite sides of the table. But if you can bring them together around a particular a uh, very specific use case that they all can agree on. I think that's a huge challenge that needs to be met. Because once you can do that and you get everyone around that one term, I think it's important to first go to that one idea in a thoughtful way. Pick one that will be a good foundation. It's a layered approach. So it's like the onion. You can't just put the whole onion out there. You gotta figure out what that innermost layer is and start there and get everyone to agree on it. And then think about it though, like, like a chess player would. It's not checkers. We're not playing one turn at a time. We're playing multiple turns at one time. So we have to understand, okay, if we're going to start here, and I always argue credentialing and enrollment, and we've talked about this a lot today, but that's perhaps the best spot because once you get the provider and the payer to agree that these are the providers that are going to be rendering the service, well, we can then submit claims because we already agreed that they're going to be the rendering the services. Oh, and then we were submitting claims. Well, why don't we start working on payments? And then you can start seeing how it's going to evolve in a layered approach. Uh, and then, quite frankly, you would almost argue that before credentialing enrollment, these relationships between the provider and payer have already started with a contract. Those providers are signed up with Blue Cross based on a payer agreement with a fee schedule, and you can almost go to the smart contract layer and then work there first. And so I think it's just really important to look at it uh, with a single use case that's very specific that everyone can agree on in that stakeholder group and then be thoughtful in terms of how it's going to roll out uh, while also keeping in mind with the guardrails that we have and we, uh, we appreciate. We have HIPAA because we want to protect our data and the data isn't in our hands, any, in, in our hands yet. It's in the provider's hands and the payer's hands and the patients need it first, but we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. So I think there are really three things that we need to look at. We need to make a paradigm shift in how we view healthcare and healthcare technology. We've been focused on illness care for many years, and now we need to move it to wellness. So I think that's a um, you know just an intellectual shift that we all need to make as consumers of healthcare. We need to go from uh, uh, encounter-based. EMR mm -hmm. to a longitudinal record. And if you have it on your smartphone and patientory is the provider that gives you that accessibility worldwide, I think that's going to be a huge, you know, we're a very mobile society anymore. So we really need to have that data available. You know, long ago, I used to photocopy my children's records when we left that town so that I'd have their medical records. And, you know, I mean, those stack up after a while and you lose them and those kinds of things. Um, EMRs are disparate systems. Even if it's the same vendor, it's a disparate system. And so this gives, I think that patientory and blockchain gives us a place to put that information so that it's readily available. And I think we need to change our thinking from patient to consumer because 
you know, uh, as we did il illness care, you know, uh, we were encounter based, we'd go to the doctor and things. I'm looking at the future generations. They're not going to consume healthcare the way that we do. They want it instant, they want to have access to all of their information, they want to be mobile. Um, disruptive technology. Too long, healthcare has been a laggard in this industry. They are slow to adopt, slow to integrate, slow to understand. You know um, how to how to get their indus or their industry um, much more efficient and cost effective. Regulations need to catch up much more rapidly. I have uh, managed, you know, multi-million dollar budgets where it's just cost prohibitive with this client server architecture that we have. And I think if we find a way to have the distributed ledger, I think we can contain some of the technology costs and improve the patient outcomes. And then um, consumption of healthcare is going to go digital, mobile, and it's going to be precision medicine. So we need to have all of the tools and every hospital and physician practice cannot have that massive data that we can aggregate and get predictive analytics from. So I think we, we're at a precipice now where we're going to make some huge changes or we are going to fail as an industry and it's such a critical industry that's not going to go away. So I hate to end here, I'm sorry they're giving me the, yeah. the end signal, but um, I encourage you all to uh, continue the discussion during our networking sessions and afterwards and thank you. <laughs>